Cool. Thank you so much, Matthew. Um, so, good morning, and welcome to my discussion on sea level rise <coughs> and outcome of global warming, which will significantly affect the future of coastal communities around the world, including that of New Zealand's extensive coastline. Following on from the research present presented in workshop one and the initial experimentation in workshop two, Today's workshop will be used to further discuss design development within the site-specific context. As a quick recap of my first workshop, the issue that I'm interested in is the consequences of global warming on oceans and coastal communities. One of the most pronounced effects of climate change has been the melting of ice at the polar regions. Based on studies of the of climate patterns during the 20th century, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has projected a one meter sea level rise by the close of the 21st century. The outcomes discussed were the increased frequency in storm surges, accelerated coastal erosion, as well as permanent inundation and increased health risks with the exposure to sewage overflows. These outcomes will have a significant impact on coastal infrastructure as well as industries that support local economic growth, as well as a forced retreat from coastal residential investment and inducing critical environmental changes to important coastal ecosystems. Present day mitigation techniques still exclude broader social, environmental and economic values of these coastal communities in preference for an engineering efficiency. However, in the context of gradual sea level rise, Contemporary innovative design strategies have displayed the opportunity for a holistic approach that incorporates and enhances important community values that support the long-term sustainability of coastal investment and well-being. The important ideas being physical resilience against storm surge and flooding, the opportunity to adapt to this change, and understanding important ecosystem dynamics to best implement these strategies which effectively brought me to this theory of the anti-fragile. If sea level rise is projected to change coastal living, then as designers we should see this as an opportunity to define future livability for our coastal communities. Anti-fragile thinking encourages a high degree of redundancy to ensure that something does not merely withstand shock or disturbance, but actually improves or enhances because of it. So in a world where sea level rise will have serious repercussions for roughly one quarter of the current global population, how can landscape architects contribute to the development of resilient coastal communities through innovative design strategies? So as a representation of Auckland's east coast, I've chosen to work with the Funga Teal Harbour the site is located 80 kilometers north of the Auckland CBD and is roughly just under an hour's drive from the central city. The 4,190 hectare catchment is defined by Cape Rodney to the north and the Tawharanui Peninsula to the south, reaching a maximum elevation of 440 meters. Now this tall ridge exposes the low-lying flatland and a projected one meter sea level rise could significantly affect the area through permanent inundation, as well as accelerating erosion of the coastline. Affected are the people that reside in these low-lying areas, a population of 1,449 residents across 1,710 dwellings. And these lifestyles range from large rural sections to medium density subdivisions. The urbanized area is also made up of commercial zones as well as private owned vineyards and farmlands that best utilize the rich soils in the area. Designated subdivision development at Point Wells is located in this inundation zone, which calls for critical design thinking to sustain future livability and ensure the long-term survival of existing and future investment. It may also be required to reconsider existing and future infrastructure in light of increased storm occurrence at Point Wells and develop methods of sustainable stormwater management to minimize contaminated runoff into the harbor. My initial exploration of the site along various coastal locations 
found the much expected evidence of erosion and flood damage. Walking along the coastal perimeter of Point Wells, located in the flood zone, I came across a low degraded seawall, which effectively extends the entire section of the coastline, restricting public access. In the event of storm surge, increasing volumes of water would easily spill over this minor elevation and render the entire flatland community to inundation. However, the underutilized pu public park space separating housing from the coastal edge generated a series of questions and effectively was seen as a critical space for intervention that in some way may possibly support increased resilience for the community of Point Wells. To broaden my own perspective on design for the coastal zone, I looked at a series of innovative design strategies with a particular focus on strengthening the idea of the anti-fragile. I narrowed down on case studies that followed the critical ideas of resilience, adaptability, and important ecosystem dynamics. Disco discovered were a series of innovative strategies, some of which looked at reimagining wharf spaces on New York's waterfront to serve as natural flood treatment areas. Some looked at offshore de design interventions that completely changed open coast beach environments into harbors, opening up alternative opportunities for recreation. Some pushed innovation and creativity to, to the point where oysters were being used to naturally remediate contaminated water in, through, through biofiltration. Now, using some of these design ideas extrapolated from those case studies, I experimented with offshore interventions and on-land flood treatment devices at various different sections along the coastline, which effectively drilled down to the key area for design intervention, the Point, Wo Point Wells Reserve. Design development began by dividing this coastal zone into three, three sections, a public reserve, a public private zone, and a regulated private zone. The reason for this zonation was to develop and understand how different areas may be restructured to minimize disturbance during storm events and support livability during calm coastal conditions as well. What followed were a series of experimental sketches where, which were developed to reimagine this coastal section in these different climate conditions and consequently stitched together to, to develop the overall master plan. Starting from the north, the revitalization of the public park space was driven by the idea of maximizing public interaction with the coastal zone in light of increased storm surge and flooding. The fundamental requirement was to increase permeability to avoid flooding of the entire peninsula. To achieve this, a series of storm, storm waters focused into a series of proposed treatment areas where contaminants will be filtered naturally through the uptake of root systems of native vegetation. On the idea of prioritizing public interaction, the proposed terraces along the tip of Point Wells capitalizes on the phenomenal view shelves across the harbor and even highlights the big Omaha Wharf, which once supported early settlement and economic growth in the area. These terraces themselves celebrate recreation and well-being allowing public to step down to the water's edge and consequently access their marine environment. From here, an undulating boardwalk pathway provides accessibility across the treatment trains and into this public park. Its form and shape follows the existing topography of the site and reveals three pocket spaces for interaction and recreation. The second of the three zones focuses on the integration of public and private land. The section has been restructured to include natural treatment devices, as well as open space sections for interaction and recreation, specifically for the adjacent line of housing. While this gradually degrading coastal space is public land, public access is now focused to the offshore boardwalk, which extends into the harbor. This intervention follows the ideas surrounding offshore implementation and intervention. 
its structure, the, board, the structure of the boardwalk forces water to change direction and slow down upon arrival to the coast. What is achieved is a minimizing of erosional behavior along the coastal edge. As currents slow down, carried sediment is deposited, beginning a natural process of reclamation along what is now currently seen as a receding and degrading coastal edge. Now, influenced heavily by the environmental design speculation on New York's harbor, I explored this concept of biofiltration to support the remediation of lingering contaminants in the Fangatia Harbor through oysters. A single adult oyster filters roughly up to 200 liters of water in a single day. As a collective group, it is likely that water quality in the harbor is improved through this low impact cost effective method. Based on this idea, I developed what I like to call the Oyster Observatory. The semi-submerged 10 meter wide observatory extends into the harbor environment to look out on the proposed artificial oyster reef. A collection of netted mesh will extend from the observatory, supporting oyster attachment and as a result, an area for cultivation. While its purpose is focused on attenuating aggressive waves and storm conditions and remediating water quality in the harbor, this coastal feature is a critical element that serves the wider ecology of the catchment. What I mean by this is that one of the notable landscape features I came across while exploring the catchment during preliminary analysis was that of the shorebird sanctuary on Omaha Spit. Exemplifying local biodiversity, this site features an extensive range of native birds that feed on the estuary at low tide. Some of these species, such as the New Zealand dotterel, nest at the Omaha Spit in significant numbers. What is developed at the Oyster Observatory is an important feeding site for the Omaha shorebirds, such as the oyster catcher, consequently supporting the extension of ecological networks, as well as consideration to the birds of the wider context of the Haraki Gulf. Outside of this, the observatory itself is just an interesting coastal attraction that allows and welcomes local community and tourists to learn about the harbor while taking in the scenic view shafts across the waters. Which brings me to the third and final area along the coastline. Located on the edge of subdivision development at Point Wells, this zone is by far the most degraded section along the coastal parkland. In fact, public access is virtually impossible due to its state. To somewhat restore the degrading coastline, offshore stakes, much like those seen in the reclamation practice by the Dutch, are introduced to the coastal environment. If storm conditions erode adjacent sections of the coastline, these stakes aim to intercept some of that sediment carried by the fast water channel and consequently focus on gradual land reclamation over time. This concept was also used locally during the restoration of the Mangafai Spit. A series of stakes were installed into the sand in a linear pattern, and with netting in between these stakes, dune buildup was accelerated, which was then retained through planting of dune vegetation. As an extension of this natural treatment practice, proposed is a coastal wetland, focused on remediating stormwater runoff from the adjacent developed subdivision prior to discharge into the harbor. What the wetland contributes is a collection of newly introduced riparian planting with a rich wetland ecology that contributes to the growth of local biodiversity. In the context of increased biodiversity, a section of coastal riprap is proposed for increased habitat availability for the monitored cultivation of oysters, as well as to fortify the coastal edge of the proposed subdivision. This rocky outcrop also provides an informal recreational experience. As water levels fluctuate between high tide and low tide, tidal pools are showcased within the rocks, generating an interesting educational coastal feature. Now, to tie these ideas in together, according to current zoning of the proposed subdivision development, titles on two of the coastal sections have yet to be released and purposed. With these sections, Currently in the hands of council, I propose and argue the development of a research institute on this prime coastal location. The key behind the institute is to provide research into 
provide research using the Whangateo Harbour itself as a critical case study to support the development of ongoing climate study. Monitoring and reviewing the state of the harbour environment may also be made available for visitors to the Research Institute. This can be achieved through the proposed offshore boardwalk, which will be opened and regulated to visitors. The educational tourist attraction can help people understand the proposed interventions, during, including reclamation, oyster cultivation, sustainable stormwater management, and in general, the overall master plan that contributes to the increased resilience within the Point Wells community. To somewhat gain an understanding on how this research institute may be designed, I looked at a few case studies such as the new Googleplex campus, uh, Apple's new headquarters, and the Greenland's National Gallery of Art. These innovative pieces of architecture have all been designed to best exist in the natural environment with a particular focus on sustainable energy consumption as well as including low impact materiality to minimize any possible damage to the neighboring context. The development of the Research Institute opens up many opportunities within the local context. Much like the purpose of this project, it sheds light on guidance that future urbanism may require. The vision for the Institute is to bring together the many different practices using climate con local climate conditions to support ongoing development of up-to-date climate research. As a way of communicating and understanding some of the proposed landscape interventions, these sections display how many of the ideas discussed today may coexist in the redesigned coastal park. Important treatment areas may serve as a form of flood control, as well as important ecological features and still somewhat allow public interaction in many ways for well-being and recreation. As a whole, the design interventions discussed today worked together to achieve maximum redundancy within the coastal subdivision. If flooding is a likely occurrence, then the treatment areas are activated and allow for flooding to be infiltrated instead of leaving the entire flatland community inundated. What I have come to find is that rising sea levels can be dealt with in one of two ways. We can force individual property owners to renovate their existing property to meet the new elevation standards like that in Point Wells where the minimum requirement is now two meters above sea level. Or on the other hand, we can encourage contemporary design thinking, which effectively looks at broad scale and, and, even, and even a regional approach where the minimum, uh, Effectively, the newfound approach supports the interaction between urban ecology and engineering. We can encourage adaptive landscape strategies that aim to retain long-term investment at the coastal, in the coastal lifestyle, as well as the ongoing sustainability in these natural environments. Things like funding to achieve these outcomes can even be made possible through interventions like that of the Research Institute that may simply be open to public for a small fee upon entry and effectively see the development of the overall master plan as a series of phases. However, the underlying theme is that our coastal areas are some of the most valuable natural public space assets. All the threats that sea level rise may bring to low-lying coastal urban areas will almost certainly force change to the coastal lifestyle. Landscape architects leading collaborative practice have the full potential to define that change, providing resilience in communities to best secure our progress to date and advancing equitable and sustainable future human development. Thank you. And I'd just like to invite our panel, um, who are made up today of Bruno Akers, uh, who is Director of Historic Studies at, uh, at the Architecture School of Victoria, and one leader who is an urban designer and architect, the CBRW Fisher. So, who wants to? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, first of all, congratulations for your presentation. I think it was very well structured. You were very fluent in what you were talking, which you know, just shows us that you know what you're talking about. Um, I think it was very professional, the way that you presented and structured the whole thing. So in that way, thank you for that. Thank you. Um, um, 
I was very impressed in the way that you research, you structure your research, and and all the rationale and the argument that you brought forward in order to support your design intentions. So in that way, I think that that you know it was a very well structured work, and and all the the theoretical background that you took on board is very relevant for the present day, and you know it seems that the place, the site that you are focusing on, uh, it's in a desperate need for being reinvented in a, in a certain way. Um, going to design, uh, I, I, I thought it, um, w what you presented was, was very appealing and convincing and, and the graphic quality is, 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 is good, so well done for that as well. Um, in terms of the strategies that you were talking, um, I, I, I have a couple of questions because you, the only thing that I, I understood from your side was the biofiltration, that, that will be one of your design okay. strategies. So do you mind to develop a bit more what other strategies are you bringing on board? Am I bringing on board? So, um, part of, so accommodating that, um, part of the idea is to accept, move away from this idea of kind of fighting the coastal and mm -hmm. inland zone through seawall technology and existing engineering and looking at landscape as a way of accepting some of that you know, some of that flooding on land um, yeah. and you know, redirecting that water into you know, containment zones, treatment areas and ways in which we can deal with that water, um, mm. ways in which we may drain the landscape where we may you know, just have it as a, as a, a method of, I guess, moving away from having our subdivisions sort of completely inundated mm. and stressing out on existing stormwater piping and have yeah. a place, you know, and that's where these kind of treatment areas come into play. Um, some of the other sort of ideas that I'm thinking about is um, things like the offshore boardwalks mm. and you know, how it's structural elements of the boardwalks may you know, serve a purpose, you know, looking at basic sort of principles of kind of fluid dynamics um, and the relationship that water has with these boardwalk structures. Um, you know, as water is kind of you know, forced to move through these transparent st structures that, you know, and erosive behavior, mm. you're looking at you know, a change in velocity, which means a change in speed and um, dropping any you know, sediment that's carried and changing an erosive sort of process to a depository section. Yeah, um, yeah. And looking at reclamation, I guess right now it's um, something that has crossed my mind is um, you know, what opportunities does that bring if we're looking at land reclamation? Mm -hmm. um, you know, what can we do with the land that we've reclaimed? Um, yeah. Yeah. That, sounds, that sounds great. I just think that you <coughs> probably need to include in your in your panels a diagram to summarize all of that okay. because yeah. there is a couple of transitions that um, if we don't know precisely the site, it's course. somehow yeah. hard to follow sometimes. Okay. Um, <coughs> so that that would be one thing. The other aspects that I also thought that might need um, a little bit more development. It's just the transition from your sketches down there to the final result. Okay. I think that you need probably to to map a little bit more okay. the process that you use to go yeah. from your initial yeah. idea to the final outcome. Uh, just kind of time exactly. Yeah. Just 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 to to map the design process in order to understand how did you start, where did you reach, what did you abandon in between that you thought it was not viable to do okay. or it was not a good solution in order that we could really understand how did you reach there. Um, in terms of design, um, do you mind to explain in your plan B that you have yeah. here, um, or either in plan A, I, I find that you approach the edge condition very well towards the sea, but the edge condition towards the land seems yeah. slightly odd sometimes. Yeah. Um, based it on seems very geometrical, so what is the rationale yeah. behind that? Um, so all these areas, of, um, as a section, that's kind of what that sort of coastal width mm. is like. That relationship is you know, private land and then in some areas kind of fenced off, in some mm. areas left open to extend out okay. into the beach. Um, so it was just about private property and the boundaries. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. boundaries of the mm. sections. Um, mm. In terms of the kind of landscape itself, you know, seeing seeing this kind of grass sort of mm -hmm. landscape that extends out to the coastal environment, mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's okay. the landscape. That explains maybe why. That's, yeah, maybe graphic quality in terms of like yeah. grey. No, it just seems like you know very too much yeah. like. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, <coughs> 
the other thing that's, you know, I, I really like the idea of the Oyster uh, Observatory, and one of my questions around that would be, um, you know, it all explains the biofiltration, which is, I think is awesome, but the other part would be, um, have you thought about the economical, economic viability of that? Um, what will happen to the oysters afterwards? Will they be edible, commercialized? Uh, yeah, see, so, so, um, that's something that we've been kind of discussing as well, because if they are being used for filtration, then yeah. evidently they become contaminated. Yeah. Um, and we don't want to eat them. So, um, yeah. but so what will happen to the oysters? Yeah, so I Collateral guess, damage. <laughs> <laughs> um, I suppose... Better oysters than us. Mm. <laughs> I suppose in terms of the kind of, it's, you know, look, maybe it could be a recycling sort of, you know, method or maybe, you mm. know, maybe we don't need those oysters now, maybe in 50 years time mm. we get our harbour to a condition mm. where, you know, contaminants are minimal, um, mm. you know, we won't get as sick, um, but, <laughs> um, but yeah, maybe, you know, maybe it doesn't support sort of. Or maybe the people. people, the people will just get immune to the, <laughs> to all the contaminants. That's all right. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, like, I was just curious to know if you talked about that. So, yeah, what, you yeah. know, like, in order that you have this very robust system that yeah. um, you know what's going to happen in all the stages, in all the processes. And um, I thought that your programmatic decisions were, you know, were good, logical. Um, I think that some of those programmatic decisions that you did along the shore, you probably need to explain them a little bit more, okay. but I reckon that probably will happen in the upcoming six okay. months that you're going to. You know, like Google, you know, that you allocated treatment areas, so okay. how that's going to function, what we'll yep. be treating, what are the volumes we're going to be talking about, yep. what will be the plants that will be there, blah, 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 all that kind of stuff. And that's, but, but I think that you have a very solid project, so I think you're on the right track. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree with, with Bruno about the presentation, pretty really solid and organized and just because I'm a little bit kind of as Burton's when you two things about the format really okay. which they are really minor if you start with the vertical format okay. with the north of the page don't turn it 90 degrees that mm -hmm. throws me completely and I don't really see any kind of <laughs> real reason to do that. Because it's a matter and of layout. <laughs> <laughs> uh, other to confuse yeah. the reader. Yeah. Um, and the other thing, if you start with you start with A, Bs, and Cs, change to numbers on the sections. So I uh, once again to avoid confusion. If I'm looking at A. And A is kind of really pedantic if you want a uh, comment. But uh, if you allocate the letters for the areas, okay. yes, change okay. the numbers for the sections. Okay. Um, and the third thing about format, I think the A, B's, and C's, which are your areas, they need to be on this, on this map. Okay. I get a little bit lost between that one and that one. Okay, sure. There. And which um, the reason behind this kind of clarification is you are putting a lot of emphasis on people accessing this area. How do the people arrive to okay. this? A, B, and C. Um, so A is accessible. So can you can you write A, B, and C on or point A, B, and C on accessibility? On accessibility. Oh, yeah. well, there's A. Oh, there's yeah, there's A. There's gate areas, little sort of narrow passages. Yeah, yes, like you mean the overall sections? Or? Yeah. Oh, yeah. the overall sections are A, B, A, B, oh. and C. So how do people or cars or tourists or locals arrive cross basically that geometric line that Bruno was saying, which is the boundary in New Zealand between private oh, land, yeah. you don't walk here, mm. and yeah. the harbour is, you know, yeah. all of us happy to... Yeah. So, 
um, this, the main sort of access way through the tip of Point Wells. Mm -hmm. um, there's also a laneway straight through Harborview Road. Um, proposed with the Oyster Intervention, there's a laneway in there as well. Mm -hmm. um, and with proposed subdivision development and proposed infrastructure, um, that opens up accessibility to the final section. Um, so you have to do that walking, or is there a kind of a technical loop? This, oh, the coastal walkway? Yeah. Um, uh, it's focused on pedestrians. And, uh, so it's a destination. Basically, yeah, yeah. go there for the day, walk the thing. Yeah. And then if you want to leave, yeah. you have to walk back the same way that you came yeah. to your car. Yeah. Uh, Is that correct? You could leave at some sort of destination, come back inland and sort of walk through, or um, it could be seen as a loop it, that's composed the design. Yeah. I mean, that probably, I think you should kind of investigate okay. or, you know, just simple diagrams yeah. of what is the flow of people and vehicles. And okay. what I know is the boat ramp. Is that a new boat ramp? Oh, it's, it's, it's existing. existing? Um, yeah, existing. Have um, you taken photos of the height of the summer and the, every single electrician and plumber with their boats and on the boat ramp? Um, I've seen massive amounts okay. of trailers, vehicles, um, and the logistics of um, boats in this type of situations. I mean, there is the sample. I'm familiarized with the with the one in Mangafai, yeah. and um, it's completely crazy. You have like not just two or three boats, but like dozens of trailers yeah. and boats, and okay. you know, massive operation. Yeah. Um, you have another situation in Langs with boats and tractors okay. destroying basically the yeah. what you would call beach. Yeah. And another thing, and this is just once again kind of feel gut feel more than than yeah a seriously supported common is how many million dollars do you need to do this project? Um, give me a cost breakdown next time. Um, <laughs> no, but um, I, I guess part of the sort of views on this is that you know near to the end of you know just actually coming up with the master plan is that you know maybe this is seen as you know, a series of phases that we look at in terms of you know how it's developed. It's you know not just a kind of we're going to build the whole thing at once, but yeah. you know, you know, interventions like that at the research institute, you know, having that as a you know a critical kind of element that you know supports further you know, investment and supports you know further build up of yeah, you know, that makes sense. But, yeah. So probably you need to kind of establish a hierarchy. Okay. What is your project pivoting? Yeah. Like, do you need the research institute the first thing, yeah. or do you need the you know put the pontoons the first thing? Yeah. What is the thing that if does not happen, your project disappears? Yeah. Okay. So if you kind of diagrammatically sketch yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and one thing that I kind of, I think you show, should show a little bit more on your, on, especially on your drawings. Mm -hmm. It feels a little bit man-made. Okay. Um, New Zealand, you can convince convince the, the local contractors to get and organize a, you know, bring their diggers for a weekend and do a massive operation. It feels like uh, too manicure to me on the on the things. And it would be great if you kind of manage to to give a new life to everything that you've seen on those first yeah. pictures okay. like i don't know you find somewhere else that there is 
350 volts of those ones on the degrading picture yeah. that you can bring and reuse for the pontoon and the locals will bring the poles and you just need them fit you know so there is this kind of growing yeah. and constructing of the project okay. by the actual people okay. instead of private line geometric line and then the council or developers come put a lot of millions and then when it's once it's finished you enjoy it so kind of yeah, at the beginning of the project, we well, the project was kind of initiated by Garth Faulkner, mm. and who lives there. Uh, not a point well, but lives in the town, and he's knows people in point wells. And so one of the issues, one of the things was that you were going to present it to the community, you were going to present this project to the community, yeah. and get that feedback, and so maybe that's a way of, is yeah. you, are you still planning to, to do that? Um, yeah, it's, it's, it develops if it's, um, get it to a point where it's, that might, that might answer some of your questions yeah, if, you, if, you, if you have that. If, if you're going to present to the community, I think it's very important that you look now at your project and you start to realize what are the formal qualities that you want the users to experience, because I think the qualities of the space is something that might help you to refine a bit of those of that design to make it more suitable for yeah. what you're aiming to accomplish. Yeah. Uh, just imagine yourself as a user going through that pathway and what kind of qualities do you want people to Experience. be exposed to? Yes. Okay. And I think we talked about it last time, but you know, the Omaha community group, you know, these sort of private groups who have houses on the sea, you know, they kind of get together and do their own kind of thing on the edge. So, I mean, tap, it's sort of mm. tapping into that kind of energy or mm. um, avarice, <laughs> yeah. you know, uh, whatever it is. Um, you know, if you could kind of demonstrate so that way, ways yeah. of the you know, ways of, of working, the ways that these things can happen. You know, mm -hmm. that it's not just you know, the government or the local body yeah. or whatever, you know, there's actually kind of these multi connections. So I think maybe go maybe this is a good stage because you you obviously developed probably to a really good stage, maybe it's a good stage to go back over summer and mm -hmm. engage with the community with yeah. the art yeah. and talk to the people and stakeholders and so mm -hmm. forth and then that I think that would really Enrich your project, so when you come back, you're kind of going, you know, I tested this and yeah, yeah, I did this and yeah. yeah. I mean, it's amazing how if you convince few locals, this type of projects will happen, yeah. like for no reason. And once again, I refer to Manga Five because it's where we spend the summers. But it's like suddenly, you know, a group of ladies yeah. there, they just raise a million bucks and yeah. build a museum, yeah. which is horrible in shape, but, you know, it's a museum. Yeah. And, and it's a million bucks. Uh, and then you have, you know, the Harvard Restoration. Yeah. Well, they have kind of drenched for the last 20 years the Harvard. Yeah. It's just incredible. Now, another group, community group, they just built a skate park, which is just mm. phenomenal. With leftovers, with the local machinery, with, I mean, and it's just full yeah. of people. And um, so all this kind of, you know, tapping into the, into the local kind of energy, I think is quite, yeah, yeah. yeah. important. Um, and then one number that I think it misses, that is missing on your, on that top picture, the one uh, the population 1449 yeah. dwelling catchment. I think one number that is miss, missing there is the the cost of the economic uh, economic cost of the catastrophe. Like I'm sure that if you Google it if point wells will go underground or underwater in this case uh, will be i don't know 577 million dollars you know as a kind of as a reference yeah. our project could be developed in i don't know over five years for so comparatively eh, you start establishing a kind of a reality yeah 
otherwise, you know, if the economic catastrophe is one million dollars, who cares? I mean, look, I crashed your, you know, multi-billion dollar catastrophe, and life keeps going. So really, need to put it on perspective, I think. Yes, good. Yeah, yeah, I have a comment. Catastrophe. We'll now we're talking the important things. I like that. Uh, Shane, you are very accomplished uh, graphic communicator, so I'll, uh, I won't comment on that. I want to comment on the language that you are using. Uh, I think that uh, you, you could uh, maybe think a little more about your research question, the way you word it, and perhaps even uh, the title. Um, in particular, I have a problem with the words management and, and development in your research question, and I'll tell you why. Your, your overall title is Rising Tides and the Future of New Zealand's Coastal Communities. Uh, I think that's a great topic. It really is a serious issue. We need to worry about these communities, and in fact, I would recommend that you uh, eventually provide an introduction into your topic by mapping all the coastal communities yeah. in, in the northern coast, the Pacific coast of this, northern, northern of New Zealand, all the way from Pakatani to Fangarai, put all the dots for all these Omahas that are sitting there like ducks waiting to be shot by, uh, by a storm. That will give really kind of, you know, uh, relevance to your, your topic. Um, but the, the, the wording of the, re so kind of the title is okay. It's a big one, it's very important. And then the, the take, uh, the way you have kind of uh, defined your task through your research question, I think it's imprecise because to me, coastal management means also governance, policy, regulation, all these things, you know, uh, politics and law, which is not really what we teach in this course. And probably there isn't a properly qualified person here in, in the school to uh, help you with that. So I, I think what you're really doing here is coastal planning and coastal design uh, rather than coastal uh, management. Uh, so, so you know, be uh, be careful about that. What you what you what you're promising in your research question. Okay. The second word, uh, development of resilient coastal communities. Uh, from what I see today, you are talking about retrofitting or perhaps redevelopment, but not development. Because yeah. when we say development, we mean new ones, new, new projects, don't we? Mm. Yeah. So, well, you uh, have a research yeah, a, institute, uh, oh, and an oyster farm that you cannot eat the oyster. That's new. Yeah, that part is new. Uh, okay, that's true, but the community is not there's new. Um, it is an existing community. Yeah, that's what. So, yeah. Sorry, sorry, sorry to yeah. interrupt, but there's um, Point Wallace is expanding. It. There's subdivision development, which is effectively in the third region of the um, planning. So, so there is new. Yes, a new subdivision. Yeah, and extending at the sort of southern section to here. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, well, where where, where C is. C. Right. Well, yeah. I wouldn't put those people in that place. <laughs> but that's another well, big too discussion. <laughs> <laughs> too late. Too late. It's going ahead. All right. Well, um, back to the kind of your topic. I think it's really important, and in my view, you need to talk more about uh, how. Uh, how soon these things may happen. Catastrophes, storms, rising seas, and, and, and all that stuff. And uh, less focus on aesthetics, recreation, and even conservation, and more focus on adaptation and, and preparedness. Uh, I'm not an expert on coastal design, but I see a lot of flat surfaces there. To me, kind of as a lay person in, in this area, that doesn't look like a terribly uh, protected uh, a coastline in terms of uh, uh, storms coming both from above and, and from the sea. I, I think that the, you might find more uh, better examples of, of, of coastal uh, design which is better prepared for, for uh, you know, uh, uh, big events, you know, big extreme weather events. Uh, I think it would be something uh, that would be different from what you have here today. Okay. Uh, but 
through your, your, your presentation, there was a lot of focus on, on uh, our kind of conservation issues and uh, kind of protection of nature. I think we need to protect ourselves rather than nature. Uh, when in, in, in catastrophic situations, I think we'll be, uh, we'll, we'll be sorry that we were looking after Dotoro rather than having chicken in our backyard and kind of, you know, having uh, uh, a more local supply of the key basics of life like food and water and sanitation and energy. Uh, so, to, for me, the key word in your project is resilience and I would expect to hear more about infrastructure and dependency and the vulnerability of this community. Okay. Uh, uh, so, if this, the design of these coastal areas could be made in a, in a way that makes the independence of this community uh, stronger, then I would believe that you are pursuing the resilience brief to its full potential. Uh, it's, resilience is not about recreation and being nice to birds and all these nice things. Uh, that's kind of too late for them, I think. Yeah. Um, I guess my argument was that it is a component that in which, if we are looking at the resilience and coastal life, it is a component of the harbour and the catchment itself, um, things like reappropriation of the land, um, looking at alterations and actually you know, focusing water into treatment trains as opposed to hard infrastructure, hard, sorry, um, impermeable services, um, looking at, you know, like um, Bruno said, that going to that you know, further and looking at actually you know, design details with you know, certain sort of sections of the treatment trains or you know, the landscape itself, you know, understanding where does that water go following um, you know, once it's been focused in these areas, um, I think when we do look at these sort of innovative strategies, that uh, I'm really interested in, you know, the entire sort of you know catchment. You know, not you know, while I'm interested in people, it's you know, there's an incredible sort of acknowledgement that's required to look at you know things like the Omar Shoulders, which is an incredible landscape feature. Um, uh, that you know, kind of looking at this from a holistic approach as well. Um, which is why, uh, which is why yeah, you can replace people. Uh, you can replace them. Well, okay. yeah. <laughs> you can replace them. People. And, yeah, 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 yeah. People. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, it's, I think it's the architect mm. um, well, talking. No, well, replacement really. of some of these structures would be an, an interesting yeah. aspect of your design. Yeah. They look pretty kind of, I don't know, it's just kind of maybe it's a, the graphic present. Yeah. They, they are not credible. They're trying to be strong and they're rather kind of like they're there to stay. I don't think they're going to stay. No. I think they'll be destroyed every five years yeah. and then we'll have to rebuild them. Yeah. So if you can kind of build that kind of temporal, uh, ephemeral sort of yielding <coughs> nature into these structures, that would look more convincing to me. I think what the, both of them are trying to say to you is that you need to go back and think about your system, what are we trying to accomplish in terms of natural systems, instead of having a very hard, hardly engineered mm -hmm. kind of infrastructure, yeah. but to work more with the natural process in order to develop a resilient system that could actually protect the community. Okay. It's because, like, one of your arguments when you started in your presentation, <laughs> I'm going to be very brief. One of the points you made in the beginning of your presentation was the change from hard engineering to soft strategies. Yeah. And I think that when I told you before that you need to look back now and try to refine your design, mm -hmm. is that, that soft strategies don't really come across yet as soft. They still come as, you know, very man-made, hard structures. Yeah. So it might be that you just need to go back, revise a couple of precedents, look at something that yeah. has been more based on natural processes yeah. in order to cope with catastrophes yeah. and try to bring that on board. Okay. That were really good questions. Great discussion. Thank yeah. you very much, Edel.